we're in this series of messages, uh, conversations with Jesus, where we're looking at uh, different uh, encounters that Jesus had with different people in the Gospels, and uh, and then taking some lessons out of those to um, apply to our own lives. And so um, today, I want us to look at um, Mark chapter twelve. I hope this isn't like Susie's where I um, can't find the passage. I think I put you in the first place. <laughs> okay, Mark chapter 12, uh, starting in verse um, 28. Uh, one of the teachers of the law, one of the scribes, uh, their title, came and heard them debating. And noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answer Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and, and that there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, that's more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And then from then on, no one wanted to ask any more questions. <laughs> so, pray with me, Lord, teach us from this encounter and uh, this conversation. And, and uh, what is it that you want to uh, have happen in us? Uh, that's our prayer today. That's our need. In Jesus' name. Okay, so, have you ever met somebody that you were really excited to meet and, uh, and you look forward to it and then it may not have turned out the way you'd hoped it would, you know. Um, years ago, this, uh, for those of you who are young, you don't know what this person is, but but uh, Johnny Carson used to do this, uh, uh, this show, uh, Late Night, and uh, and so Eileen and I and a couple of friends decided to go to the Johnny Carson show uh, down in L.A., Burbank, and, and so uh, on the way in the car, I thought, you know, they might be playing Stump the Band, you know, it's this little thing that they did. And uh, so I taught them a little song, and we got there, and sure enough, they were playing Stump the Band. The director came out to the line, and we auditioned, and he took us into a special little area, and put us up at what looked like the audience, but it was actually on the stage. And, uh, and then I was going to be the one talking to Johnny. Cool. I can do that, you know, one thing, I can talk. And so uh, we get up and he said, now, now, just to let you know, John, what's going to happen is Johnny's going to come up, he's going to talk to this person and that person and that person, and you are going to think, he's out of time, we're not doing it. And right at that second, when you think that in your head, he's going to turn around and say hi to you. Okay. You know, he knew Johnny's doing these things and playing the game up in the audience, and, and I'm thinking, we're out of time. There's no way. I guess we don't get to do this. And just as I thought that in my head, he turns around and he goes, hi. And I'm supposed to talk to him. So I stand up, and you know what? I do not remember one word <laughs> that was uttered. And this was before videos and DVDs, so I, unless it's ever on the best of Johnny Carson, you know, uh, we're never going to see this. But um, I, it, it was like I thought I was going to be so cool and so funny and so eloquent, and and instead it was like boom. <laughs> <laughs> and then we sang, I've been flushed from the bathroom of your heart, and it worked. Okay, so we got our dinner for four, you know, and uh, we stumped the band. But um, for many years after, I always thought, oh, I should have said that. Oh, I should have said this. Oh, you know, that was my chance. I could have I could have really done something there, and then what happens? <laughs> Johnny Carson. <laughs> well, we're in this passage in Mark. It's a real interesting series of events that happen because if you were to start like a chapter or so earlier, it's like everybody's lining up to hit Jesus with like they get one question, they get one chance, you know, to say something or make a good impression on Jesus or on the other people, make the other people feel, you know, 
good about them. And so uh, there were there were basically four groups of people, and uh, the Pharisees who you've heard about in the Bible, and the uh, Sadducees, and the Herodians, and the scribes, and and each one takes their best shot at Jesus. And some of them he answers, and some of them he kind of pushes away and refuses to answer. And the last one is this scribe that, that we're looking at today. And one of the things that Jesus said to, to one of the groups just before this event is, the problem is you don't believe the scriptures and you don't know the power of God in your life. That's, that's the issue. And so um, it doesn't matter what I say to you because you're not going to believe anything anyway and you don't experience what God wants to have you experience in your life. And, you know, you think about that and you go, I, that may be true about us. It, it may be. So you look at this scribe's uh, question. Uh, he's, he's listened to them debating. He's listened to Jesus put down some of the other groups. He's feeling good about it. He's pretty confident he's worked this out. So now, uh, and one of his jobs is to, is to keep track of all the laws in the Old Testament, which are hundreds. Uh, Hundreds of them were positive and hundreds of them were, don't do that. But um, he was the one who meticulously kept track of all those things. And so he says to him, Jesus, which is a good question, really. You know, which, which is the most important? Let's get right down to it. What's the most important? And Jesus answers with a, a quote out of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament that um, is known as the Shema, which uh, every Jewish home, uh, if you ever go into your friend's house or Jewish and, and there's a little thing on the doorway, uh, that's the uh, Shema. And hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Uh, you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Right? And in fact, it, it, the, the Bible even says, put this on your doorways, uh, put it on your forehead. And say, one of my favorite pictures is Bob Dylan with a little box on his forehead with an elastic band around it with, with that verse in it. It's a great picture of him. And uh, some of you don't know about Bill, this doesn't matter. But, um, <laughs> um, but so it was, a, it was a very, very well-known standard core response that Jesus gave. It wasn't a shock. And, uh, and then the guy says, you know, that, that's pretty good. You know, Jesus, you got that one pretty good. You're right to say that the Lord... And then he quoted the Deuteronomy passage and he corrected Jesus. Jesus had gotten it wrong. <laughs> and so he made the correction. Because in the, in the Deuteronomy passage, it says that you'll love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And Jesus threw in with your mind. We don't separate our minds from our love of God. And that our minds are actually uh, part of what we surrender in love uh, to, in our relationship with God. And so this guy's correcting Jesus and saying, yeah, you, you, got it, you got it pretty good. Didn't get it right, you know, but you got it pretty good. And then Jesus looks at him and says, well, you, you did pretty, pretty good yourself. You're not far from the kingdom. You're not in the kingdom, but, uh, but you know, you're not far away. You can see it from where you are, but you're not in it. And the crowd got that. They understood that. And I said, you know, they, nobody wanted to ask any more questions, you know. It's gonna, um, Jesus is going to come back on them, you know. And so... Uh, so I would look at this and thinking about this. You know, what, what's, what's the issue here? And, and I think what it is, is that we have a tendency uh, to hold Jesus at a distance in our life in a controlling way by making ourselves the evaluator, ourselves the judge, you know, like this guy did, I'm going to decide, Jesus, if you give a good answer or not, you know. Uh, I'm the teacher here, really. I'm the expert on the law, and we'll see how you do. And he got a, you know, he gave Jesus a B minus, which for me, that'd be great, you know. Uh, Jesus didn't like that, but um, the thing is, we do that in our relationship with God all the time, where, where we, we put up a standard and we say, okay, God, I want you to meet this. Do this for me because this is what 
um, I'm expecting you to do or I need you to do and anything less or different or uh, that doesn't fit on my grid. So I'll trust you as long as you do things the way I determine they need to be done, right? So who's in control? That's not a rhetorical question. That actually is a question. So who's in control? We are. You know, and we say, oh yeah, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Scripture. But, but when it comes to allowing our relationship with God to permeate every area of our life, our, our emotions and our thoughts and our will and, and our, our who we are, um, our self-esteem, our issues, and all these things, our relationships with others, and then go out into loving the people around us. Um, I mean, that's like a total, a total connection with God in every area of our life, as opposed to, well, I'm going to give the Lord my religious side. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to do my church side and give that to God, and and then I'll, I'll keep the rest for me. You know, it's not like. Spiritual tithing, you know, it's kind of like you know, I'll give 10% of my life to God and then the 90% I can keep for my own stuff, uh, which is, you know, an interesting strategy. But um, but Jesus said, no, it's you love the Lord your God with all your heart and, you, and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength, the whole deal. And then that's not enough because then you express it by loving your neighbor as yourself. Well... Um, when I was growing up, I didn't understand this idea of, uh, I mean, I'd heard about having a personal relationship with Jesus, you know, that, that was always something that was, that was held up in, in church, and, and my folks being missionaries, we got that a lot, you know, uh, did you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, and, and, and I, I wanted that, but nobody explained to me or showed me or demonstrated how you do that. So instead of learning how to have a personal relationship with Jesus, what I learned was how you act when you go to church. I started looking for signals and sometimes I'd be told directly, you know, John, you don't do that. You need to do this when you come here. And how to, how to uh, act like a Christian and how to uh, look like a Christian, and how to think like a Christian, and how to, you know, fit in. So basically it was like puppy training. I was church broke. You know, they, they, broke, they put a paper down for me, spiritually speaking, you know, not really, but spiritually speaking, and, and, they, and they trained me on how to acceptably be in the church, you know, and the, and the same thing happens as a pastor, except it's more brutal, um, you know, the, the more the whipping kind of thing with the dog, but, but um, instead of opening the door to experience this personal relationship with God through every area of, of my being, I looked around for signs and signals of what a pastor should do how a pastor should be. I wonder what a pastor would say at this point. <laughs> oh, not what I was about to say, something else, you know? And so I learned how to function in a pastor way, in a Christian way, in a churchy way. I wasn't very good at it, but um, it never clicked over into uh, a real experience for me. It was more like acting. And so, uh, coming to this passage, I, I can see where, where Jesus said, look, here's the deal. You've got to love the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all your mind and, uh, and all your strength. You don't keep anything back. Let God permeate every part of who you are. Wow. Well, that's a challenge, you know, because... Uh, I didn't have very many models, you know. I mean, the church leaders around me weren't any good. Their relationships were messed up. And uh, and I didn't know how to, not only, I couldn't have a relationship with God that was natural and total and everything. Nobody taught me how to have a relationship with people. 
Figure that one out, you know? How, how do we relate to people? I remember we used to do this uh, evan years ago, evangelism training, uh, you know, it's a, teaching people how to share their faith, you know, in different ways. And, uh, and suddenly it dawned on me, we're teaching people how to go up to folks and ask questions and give answers and everything that's supposed to, you know, uh, introduce them to Jesus into a personal relationship with Jesus. And the people we're sending out have no idea how to be or talk about any relationship. And with anyone, they don't know how to have a personal relationship at work. They don't know how to have a, a personal intimate relationship with, in their marriage or with their kids or, or with their uh, neighbors. And, and, and I'm going, it's like total ignorance about relationships. And we're assuming, oh, well, why don't you just go out and help people have a relationship with Jesus? Well, wow, we've got baby steps to take here. Little tiny ones. Um, because, because Jesus doesn't want us to just have the right answers. He doesn't want us to get our beliefs right. He wants even our minds to be permeated with the love of God. Um, interesting uh, writer, uh, Dallas Willard, some of you may know him. He used to be the uh, uh, professor and then, and then it was the dean of the School of Philosophy at USC. Uh, down there in Southern California, not South Carolina. And uh, he, he writes an interesting, I want to share this with you. Um, he, he says this, a Gandhi who had looked closely at Christianity as practiced around him in Great Britain, remarked that if only Christians would live according to their belief in the teachings of Jesus, this is quote, we all would become Christians. If the Christians would just live what they believe, we'd all become Christians. And then he says, we know what he meant. And he was right in that. But the dismaying truth is that Christians were living according to their belief in the teaching of Jesus. The problem was they didn't believe them. So they were living out, but they didn't believe. And then he goes on. Moreover, knowing the right answers, knowing which ones they are, being able to identify them does not mean we believe them. To believe them, like believing anything else, means we are set to act as if they're true. And it will do so in appropriate circumstances. So our actions are based on, you know, it, this is what I believe, so therefore I'm going to act accordingly and our behavior starts to line up with our beliefs. And acting as if the right answers are true means, in turn, that we intend to obey the example of teachings of Jesus. Perhaps the hardest thing, this is what he writes, perhaps the hardest thing for sincere Christians to come to grips with is the level of real unbelief in their own life. Isn't that interesting? We as Christians, we have a level of unbelief that, that we don't want to come to grips with. The unformulated skepticism about Jesus that permeates all dimensions of our being and undermines what efforts we have mm -hmm. to move towards Christ-likeness. I know I'm reading a lot here, so hang on, hang with me. You know, philosophy department, they get wordy. <laughs> the idea that you can trust Christ and not intend to obey him is an illusion. In fact, you, you can no more trust Jesus and not intend to obey him than you could trust your doctor or your auto mechanic and not intend to follow their advice. If you don't intend to follow their advice, you simply don't trust them, period. And then he says, of course, in the case of the auto mechanic, you probably have good reason not to, not to trust them. Uh, now, what's, what's uh, Dallas Willard saying here? If we're going to say we believe, then we need to act accordingly. Our lives start to, to take on the shape and the, uh, and the will and the direction of uh, the one that we believe in. And um, this guy in uh, Mark 12, he probably had a name, but I didn't get it there. But this guy had the right answers. And he was interested in, in correcting Jesus when Jesus didn't quite have the answer perfectly right. And, um, but he didn't actually believe what he knew. 
He knew the scriptures. He knew theology. He knew the <coughs> system of life. But he wasn't willing to actually allow it to transform him. Now, what would happen if we uh, stopped holding God at an arm's length? No, that's close enough, Lord. Right there. I don't want you in, invading my space. Uh, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna love the Lord with all of our heart and our soul and our strength and our minds, we're gonna have to relax our arms. We're gonna have to relax our arms and let Him invade our space. And what's going to happen in this is we're not gonna become more religious. Um, Actually, just the opposite. We're going to become more human as we allow God to permeate all the areas of our life. We'll become more human. We'll, we'll, uh, our, we'll experience our emotions in a new way. We're, our thoughts and, and uh, strategies in our minds will start thinking differently. Um, our will and, and our intentions will begin to change. And, and our actions and how we live this out, the implications of it, all that will begin to change. And we're going to find ourselves being transformed not less human, but actually more human, which is weird, right? I, I came across this uh, little thing I'm going to share with you. To whom it may concern is a memo. Uh, I am chronically human. If the following signs are observed, I'm not emotionally disturbed or dying. One, if you see me stumbling and falling, I may be trying something new and learning. If you find me sad, I may have realized that I've been making the same mistakes again and again and again and I'm exploring. If you find me frightened, I may be in a new situation. I'm reaching out. If you find me crying, I may have failed. I'm lonely. If you find me very quiet, I may be planning because I'm trying again. These are life signs. If the prolonged absence of the above indicators as observed, do not perform an autopsy without first giving me an opportunity and invitation for life to emerge. These are signs of life. And it's funny because it's almost the exact opposite of what I was trained in church through my life. I was trained not to feel things a certain way, not to be sad, not to try things and fail, not to, you know, I, I had all these, just look good and shut up, you know? Um, I couldn't do either. You know, I couldn't look good and I couldn't shut up. It was like, dang. So, um, but what would happen if we began to really come to life? as we allow uh, the love of God, the love for God, and the love of God for us to permeate our hearts and our souls and our mind and our strength, all of it. And then we start loving our neighbors and ourselves. According to Gandhi, we're all gonna become Christians if that happens. Who wouldn't wanna be? I think it's time for us to, to hear Jesus say, you know, you're not far from the kingdoms. <laughs> God's rule in your life is so close. Just take down your arm that is holding him at a distance. Let him, let him in. Let him hear. Let him make you human. Oh, that's his word for today. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we, we come to you and we, um, we long to know you and to follow you and, and we admit that we've got reservations and we've got issues and all those things that we've allowed to hold us back. But today we, we open our lives to you fresh and we say, Lord, come close. Come into my heart and my mind and my life and uh, give me the courage to trust you and start to act on that trust. Lord, help us to believe what we know and to trust you when we don't know what to do. We need you every hour. So we pray that you would stay close. Amen.